Uh, first of all, Paris, thanks for the time, man. Appreciate you stopping by. You're yes, the, sir. You're the first guest to wear gloves for this podcast. You came prepared for anything. Came prepared, tape and all. I do appreciate the fact that because a lot of guys will go and shower and take their time, but you wanted to pop up. You wanted to get this over with so you can get back to football, I understand. Uh, how's camping going for you? How would you compare this to rookie camp? Um, yeah, so 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 far I would say this year has been good for me. This camp has been great. Um, for me, my mentality is just trying to win day by day. I'm not worried about – I mean, tomorrow's an off day, but if we have practice tomorrow, I'm not concerned with what all we got to do tomorrow. How can I win today? So, so how, how I'm able to win in meetings, how can I win in this during one-on-ones, how can I win in the lift, just trying to keep my mind kind of centered, spend my mentality versus, uh, versus compared to last year, my mentality was kind of the same. It wasn't all too different, but also I'm trying to make sure I understand the whole playbook. I'm trying to understand the speed of the game because I was pads on um, at, you know, with the transition to this level. And, you know, I'm still concerned about the rookie duties and all those distractions. Now my only concern are spot, hands, eyes, just football, which is great. When you think back to Ohio State, whether it was Urban Meyer's offense, Ryan Day's offense, complicated stuff, and obviously you were around a lot of great players. How, how did that help you adjust to an NFL offense and being around all great players? Right. So um, I remember when I was a recruit, you know, because I was uh, I was one of the top tackles in the country coming out of high school. So when I go on these visits and they start to break down the offense in meetings, while I was sitting there with Coach Stud, and I would sit there and nod my head like I had all figured out, oh, yeah, this is a combination. This is the calls. I'd understand that thing they were talking about in high school. So when I got to Ohio State, it took me forever to learn the playbook, like the entire first year to understand the playbook because compared to high school, my high school playbook pretty much compares. I was like, Going right, we're going left. Sometimes my coach is pointing me, Paris, you're pulling from the sideline. I'm looking at my coach, you know. So, <laughs> but um, as I started to, but going into my second year when I, when I began to start understanding the entire playbook, I think that transition to now the Cardinals, I'm I'm, I'm excited. Again, it's a, it's, a, it's another small uh, another small reason why I'm happy to be here. Um, and our system is because we share the exact same offense as we did at Ohio State. Um, so I was able to pick up um, the offense actually in meetings. We were actually at the combine, and actually when I, you know, got picked here and actually started on Zooms, I actually was able to tell the truth and say, I understand all, all this. So if anything, it was just a change of terminology, um, which was awesome coming from a pro-style offense already. But in terms of the duties for an offensive lineman or the offense in general for everybody, it's very similar to Ohio State. Can you clarify there? Yeah, um, I think I think in terms of and think in terms of just the offense. I think in terms of I think in terms of um, just calls, terminologies, in terms of how we want cer- certain th- things to look. I think the offense that I had with Day is kind of close to um, the system that we're in, and, and there's a lot of NFL teams that kind of have the same system. So to be able to fall in a system, I feel like it kind of matches my the play that I that I, I came from. Um, I I think being able to, to make that jump in my position group is the same. Like again, it might not be the whole offense, but to be the whole offense is what five guys in front got to do. I'm not concerned about what receivers and stuff are doing. Sure. Because when I talked to Marvin, I was like, yeah, Marvin is just like Ohio State, right? He was like, no, no, it's not. <laughs> but but to me, it's exactly the same. So, in terms of what they're asking him to do in his position group, right? It's, it's completely different. different yeah. But for me, it's about the same. And now you got Chip Kelly at Ohio State. Yes, the legend. That's Ryan Day's guy. People don't realize when Chip took that, a lot of people are like, why would he take that? And, and there's a lot of reasons, but one of them is Ryan Day's his guy. Ryan Day mm-hmm. played for him, I think, at New Hampshire. Right. They, they go way back. Yep, that was quarterback coach, maybe his head coach. You, you played right guard in college, and you played both tackle spots, mm-hmm. correct? So right tackle to left tackle in the NFL, the, the flip. Is it the same as going from right tackle to left tackle in college or no? Um, it's a good question. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> you just got done with training camp. Well, you've been here for about ten days. You can't wait to get out of here. And here I am asking questions to make you think. Sorry. <laughs> um, man. honestly, I think maybe the transition in college was a little harder. Okay. Um, because at the time I was still trying to learn the fundamentals of, of of of, of basically how I want to play the game on what on 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 the right side of my freshman year. Then I got moved to right guard, 
Then I had to learn my fundamentals again. Then I got moved to left tackle. So each year I kept switching. So when I made that transition from left to right in the league, the good thing was I already had the, I had the fundamentals that I loved about my game. Now I just had to figure out how to transition my body because I understand what, what looked good, how it's supposed to be in general. And I transitioned to the right and refined at an NFL level. Now coming off my first season, I understand all the things that I love that I was able to do it right. So now it's like the fundamentals of the game of what it's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to feel like are already understood. So the transition to left tackle has been, has been a lot easier because it's only just take reps and have your hips and hands and eyes. Those are the only things I'm starting to flip. Besides that, I know how it should feel, how it should look, you know, it's kind of easier in the league. You mentioned talking to Marvin. Uh, what have you noticed so far from him and what are your expectations for him? Um, I think he looked, I mean, just seeing his presence in the huddle, I think he seems, he seems ready to go. There's never a moment where he's looking around for, you know, trying to figure things out. Again, I'm not in the receiver room. I don't know. I don't know if he's if the route he's running the right route or not. I'm not even looking. I'm looking at, I'm looking at the end. But, but either way, um, I mean, I think he's ready to go, um, especially, you know, coming his first year. I feel like I've always said about him, he was a college, he's a pro guy. He's always been a pro guy. So I know his approach is professional. Um, my expectations are through the roof for Marvin, but I felt like it's, um, I'm not going to say I'm biased because, I mean, I am biased, but at the same time, I feel like if anybody turns on his tape, he's electric. Um, my expectation is that when he has an opportunity to be a one-on-one -on -one and the offensive line, we, we take care of our job and we give Kyler the room to do what Kyler does, I think everybody will, you know, understand what I'm trying to get at, sure. you know, how special of a player is. So I do all the Cardinals games, but I also do college football and other sports for ESPN, ABC. And we used to do a ton of Big Ten now, ESPN, ABC. We don't have the Big Ten anymore. It's all Fox, mm -hmm. uh, NBC, and CBS. So the last few years we did not – I did the, the Cotton Bowl, Ohio State, Missouri. Marvin didn't play. Darius Robinson played and was outstanding. So – my exposure to Ohio State the last few years hasn't been what it was, but I do remember doing a game at Indiana. It was Saturday Night Football, ABC in 2021. Indiana was decent. You guys crushed them. And Marvin, so you were a sophomore. Marvin was a freshman mm -hmm. that year. I think Marvin had a couple catches, but you had an all-world wide receiver room. Do you remember when you first thought that Marvin Harrison Jr. would be an NFL guy? Like, was it right away? Was it that first practice? Because, again, there were guys around him that have all been picked in the first round. Yeah, um, honestly, we knew that he would be the one in his training camp, the first training camp um, of, of his freshman year. I remember we were sitting in the offensive line room, and for some reason, like on the tape, the cut-up tape, kind of had um, – we, we, we could see at a corner the receivers doing their drills in the corner, and our O-line coach was like, I guess we're having a bad day. He was like, let's see what some real point makers look like so you guys can get inspired. You know, That's our old O-line coach used to talk, right? So – we're starting to watch Olave. We're watching Garrett Wilson, watching Jackson and Martin. And like, and like, we're like, yo, he's going to be the one. He was the last one to go in line with them because all those guys had a lot of years on him. But you could just see like his releases with the catches he was able to make. Like, I think he might have dropped. I might be exaggerating, but from what we've known, from, from any rep that I've seen, because again, he wasn't out there with the ones until the Rose Bowl. So I would watch the twos. I'm pretty sure I've only seen him drop one or two passes in practice his whole, his whole first year, and I'm blaming the quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Just because he just never dropped it. So sure. I was like, I had to be on the quarterback. So I, I always kind of knew he'd be that guy. How much do you, do you ask questions? Are you a guy that likes to – you seem very thoughtful and somebody obviously just based on your background, you're, you always want to learn, uh, whether it's about football or about – different languages, which I want to ask you about, and I know you've been asked about a ton, but do you ask Jonah Williams questions? Did you ask DJ Humphreys a lot of questions last year about figuring things out in this league? Um, are you talking to guys in between series about what they're seeing, what happened on this play, what do we need to do differently, or are you, so are you asking a lot of questions, or are you just kind of looking at it and trying to discern yourself? Yeah, I would say I love to ask questions of them. So last year, me and Hump, we talked – each practice, we talked uh, just going in. Um, I, I did my own by my own kind of study on guys. He did his own study. Then we kind of comp and if we're going against ends, I change sides. We kind of compare and contrast it. You know, like maybe like a day or two before the game, just make sure the notes. If, if there's anything, 
I missed or he missed something to think about tendency. But I would say um, me and Hump talked a lot. It's the same for Jonah, too. Um, there's a lot of things that I love about his game that I'm like, hey, that's something I want to work on. Have you ever had this had this tendency? If you did, how'd you get out of it? I love to ask guys that played more years if they've ever, if they've ever had an issue or tendency, a habit, and how and how they got out of it. Because um, nine times out of ten, faster I can ask that question, the faster I can kind of skip that step and not waste time in this moment and just start to continue to level up a little bit. So those are guys I love to ask questions to. But in a game, um, I don't really. I don't really ask what's going on on the other side sure. that that much, really. What, what's your personality is probably unique, I would think, for sports in general. I just don't know how many pro athletes I've covered that uh, you're not fluent in Mandarin, Chinese, and Portuguese, but you knew it. You were mm-hmm. at one point very knowledgeable. Um, you have a lot of outside interests. You wrote for the student newspaper, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I don't think there are a lot of pro athletes that are doing that. Uh, do you find that your personality is unique, especially in an offensive line room? Oh, yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, a lot of people say I'm like a skilled player kind of person, personality, you know, in the in the offensive line world. Um, I say a lot of that's probably because of my mom. My mom, her background is in education. So for her, I mean, so for me, she was on me like, you need to get an A in all your classes. You're only allowed to get a B in science. You know, it wasn't strong in science, so B was enough for her. Um, I needed an A in my Chinese, and somehow, like when I was in middle school, high school, somehow when I got to college, somehow the advisors gave her access to my Carmen Canvas. So she's like, yo, why did you get, you know, a C on this? Uh, homework assignment, where are you seeing this? I'm in college. You know what I mean? How'd you get my password? But, um, but yeah, she's, you know, she's trying to make sure that, you know, I'm also taking care of my stuff outside the field and stuff like that. So what got you into Mandarin, Chinese, and Portuguese? And also, did you start writing because journalism is something you want to pursue after football? Yeah, so what got me into Chinese? So my school, we were forced to take Spanish forever, terrible at Spanish. Then we got the opportunity to switch to French or Chinese. Everybody chose French, and I wanted to be different. So I was like, I'm going to Chinese. That's I'm, different. I'm, That's definitely. I want to be different. Outside the box, for sure. <laughs> and it turned out to be one of the, probably one of the easiest things I've ever learned because it's so strict. It's so strict. Tones are so strict. So I felt like um, it's. I was able to pick it up easy. I was able to pick it up really easy. For some reason, it just made sense. When you especially compare it to to the English language, where there's something I might say in ten years, and you're like, oh, you can't say that, or whoa, what does that even mean? The English language changed on a daily basis, and depending on what part of the country and it sounds different, but in Chinese, it's all the same. Um, as far as like like so like as far as with Brazilian, uh, with Portuguese, when I made the switch, um, so I could get my credits for language, um, I found it a lot easier than Spanish. And um, so my girlfriend at the time, um, she um, her her so her, her family is from Brazil. So I kind of was able to, I learned better language in person. So in our dorm, our apartment, we would only speak, we, we, we would only speak in other languages, you know, at the house and, and Portuguese all, all the time, Wow. you know. So that's how I get my practice in. And then naturally, you know, I can say this now I graduated. She helped me with some of my homework, naturally. Uh, as far as <laughs> Portuguese, it was tough. But, but to, through, through it all, I feel like, I started to gain a love for the language, stuff like that. So do you have Duolingo? Um, do you know what it is? It's I tried it. on your phone? I Did tried you? it, but it just was, I'm so much better in person. I'm so much, because the person on Duolingo, there's no Brazilian person that sounds like, that. you know, if you actually go down, a, like if you do Duolingo, it'll give you false confidence. Then you'll go down to Brazil and you'll be like, oh, through the bang. And it'll be like, yeah, you believe it. And you're like, oh, shoot. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Okay. So. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So if I ever want to, take Portuguese don't don't do dual because I do Italian on Duolingo mm-hmm. um, and, and it's a hard language but I'm not like trying to be fluent I'm just trying to be able to go mm-hmm. over there and be able to talk to people and For have sure. conversations but you're saying don't do that if you want to do Portuguese or Mandarin like, Chinese I, yeah I mean I feel it kind of depends depends um, I've watched you play obviously and you, you're such a um, mild-mannered person here just talking with you but obviously you, you can get nasty on the field 
Is that like, is there a switch? Is there something you think about? Is it natural to you where when you, you get out there for a game, this personality that we're seeing here changes? Because mm-hmm. I know a lot of guys that are very mild mannered, soft spoken, and some of these guys are the toughest, nastiest football players. I'm just curious, like, where that comes from for you. I think that kind of mentality is like a thing, it's more of a thing it's like something for me it's like I felt the reason why I the reason why I'm here to play this game is to give the glory to God so I feel like to me like even when I come in I listen to gospel music and my headphones when I'm getting amped up before we take the field like for me I feel the difference for me is that it builds up kind of a like a uh like it starts to make me intense almost like when I think about my God-given purpose to be here it's like if you felt like if it was your like you were, if you were living your God given purpose by trying to stop me from walking over there, and that's going to glorify your purpose of being here, then you're going to fight like hell to make sure, you know, you know, you, you, know, do, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I feel like to me, that's kind of the mentality I feel like, like when I step on the field, and that's why I have that, you know, what I mean? because a person can only be angry. I saw this on my Instagram for like two or three minutes, and then you're forcing it. But I feel like when it's a spiritual thing, spiritual type type of intensity and you feel like you're doing it for more than yourself than for the game but you're doing it because that's your per- whole purpose of being here then i think the look, look that you have in your eye just just kind of nat- supernaturally changes i feel like you know so do you have a specific playlist that you listen to oh, I and, do. And, and is lecrae on that playlist he is not it's more old school choir it's like the old school um where it's like the the singer and a choir, it's like they're battling and out, trying to be louder and trying to bring the man. Uh, it's, and that it's, gets you that gets you fired it up. Gives for me football. Ch- it gives me the chills right now just thinking about it. It's like it's different. All right, last question. I mentioned that game against Indiana in college, and I remember we spent a lot of time on the broadcast talking about C.J. Stroud mm-hmm. for good reason. He was unreal in college, but for whatever reason, when he came out. There were a lot of people that said, well, you look at the history of Ohio State quarterbacks, and people pointed at the time to the late Dwayne Haskins, who you know, struggled in the NFL. And I think a lot of people said, well, maybe C.J., maybe it's just whatever they're doing at Ohio State, it's not going to translate. But obviously, C.J. was tremendous last year. A lot of people think the Texans are going to be in the mix for the Super Bowl. Were you surprised at all from what you saw from him last year? I'm guessing the answer is no, but you have a different perspective than we did because you know him and you played with him and you were in that locker room with him. Yeah, I mean, the see what he did last season came as no surprise for anybody that was on the field with him the past season. I mean, the like before, the year before. Um, that's just, the, I mean, I think putting him in a category of like he's bound to not have the career he's to have because he's an Ohio State court. I mean, I don't really believe in all that. I think no. everybody – has their own reasons. Yeah. Why or why not? They're able to do what, what they want to do in the NFL. But, I mean, just the arm talent that he has and just I think the I think he plays the same way as me in a way that he plays, you know, for some that's a lot larger than him. You know what I mean? So he wants to play the core if I got to. And obviously I feel like, you know, he's been, I think he's with a good team that's putting the weapons around him to complement his game. And so it's exciting to see what he does. Obviously, you look at him just physically, and then you look at Kyler, and their stature is very different, but obviously both very skilled. Are you start? What do you see in Kyler? Are you seeing things that you saw in CJ when you were with him in Columbus? I do. I do. I mean, I think I think, um, the, I think the, the coolest thing that people don't talk about, like everyone talks about Kyler, okay, he's electric with his feet, his vision, able to move around to get the receivers open to find those pockets to throw into, but I think it's really just like like the way his mind works, his mindset. To me, the mindset of how he sees himself, his mindset with how how he sees how he sees uh, guys on the team that can that can lead and that, that that can step up and that can like be those all pro type guys and have that all pro type mindset. I think for me, I think that's one of his the, the, the strongest attributes in his game. And honestly, I think that's what that's what separates him just outside of the physical. Everybody knows about the physical traits he has, but I think that mindset he has is a different level. Listen, Paris, appreciate the time, man. Thanks Thank for coming you. in. Appreciate nice it. Chat, nice chatting with you. Thank you.